Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here today for our second issue briefing. We've moved swiftly on from the Tunisian Revolution half an hour ago to a perennially favourite topic of discussion here at the World Economic Forum, the issue of the gender gap. Um, a, a very timely uh, you know, point in the, the meeting to discuss this, not just because it's a, a topic which always comes up, it's always highly controversial, but also because we have a, a, lot, new re of, a lot more research in this field that hopefully will help us understand the exact impact and implications of the gender gap as we move towards the transition that we're calling the fourth industrial revolution. As you know, issue briefings are very short in time, so we don't have long to cover quite a deep and certainly interesting controversial subject. So I'm going to keep my remarks to a minimum. I will just, however, introduce my panel. First of all, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Sadia Zahidi, who's Head of Employment and Gender Initiatives at the Forum, member of our executive committee, to discuss some of the key findings and highlights from a recent report we put out on Monday on the industry gender gap and what it, exactly it means as we head towards this revolution. Teresa Whitmarsh is executive director, Washington State Investment Board. She's got some personal experiences to share about your rise uh, through um, the career progression, as well as your personal experience as working in the financial services industry. Not a unique industry, but one that's very challenged nonetheless when it comes to gender balance. Mara Swan is Executive Vice President, Global Strategy and Talent and Manpower in the USA, uh, a, a long-term partner of the forum in our work on gender parity, and also I believe you have some more research. More importantly, you're at the cutting edge of trying to work with your clients to break down that barrier, and I'm sure you've got experiences to tell, to share as well. Sadia, over to you first, please. Okay. Thank you, Oli. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, this report that we put out on Monday on the future of jobs, which had a pretty significant section on the industry gender gap. I'm representing the work of many people. So my co-authors inside the forum are external collaborators from the Global Agenda Councils on the Future of Jobs and Gender Parity. Mara has been involved with that. Um, let me try to give you just a few highlights. Uh, one, most businesses state that they want to hire and promote and retain more women. Where there tends to be a failure is on the action. And so to try to understand that and unpack that a little bit, we asked for the reasons um, why. Just before I get there, the, that statement that we want to recruit, retain, um, promote more women is even more prominent in the traditionally male-dominated industries. They are certainly feeling the pressure to try to reverse that gender gap. Um, and the reasons range from uh, being a moral imperative all the way through to a business imperative. But what's come out quite clearly from the study is that about half of the businesses uh, lean towards the moral argument. And then there's a variety of reasons um, which include having a more innovative workforce, having a more diverse workforce, um, feeling some external pressure from governments and media, and then a range of other reasons that, that other businesses um, state. Um, the gender gap then obviously does persist across different industries, but what is um, very interesting about the, the study is how different it looks in different industries. And, that, that's, and part of the, the conclusion we've drawn from that is that it may take a very tailored and specific approach with different industries to try to deal with that. And the reasons are both cultural and structural. So there are issues related to unconscious biases, um, the, the sort of the, the cultural factors that many of us carry around, whether we're aware of them or not. But they're also structural. Um, a lot of organizations are still designed for uh, a society, families, uh, of, of maybe 40 or 50 years ago. And that just doesn't quite apply anymore. And so there's some, some basic design that needs to change in organizations as well as broadly for, for policy. Um, and then if we look towards the future, um, there's, there's a lot of findings about uh, where job growth is likely to come from and where job losses are likely to come from. And what's clear is there is a gender dimension to both issues. So the losses are likely to be in areas like office and administrative functions, which have actually provided mid-level or high-skilled women um, uh, middle-class livelihoods in a lot of countries, not just in the developed world, but also in emerging markets. Those jobs are going to be hollowed out. So we could see um, a, a reversal of the gender gap, particularly in those areas. And then the growth is likely to come from STEM professions. And that is where there is a, a very well-documented lack of women today. And that's where a lot of the, the structures of the organizations that employ them are not, again, are, are not set up for today's world and for today's talent. Um, so again, there could be some growing gender um, gaps there. And then um, finally, it may be time for uh, looking at the results of this, 
it may be time for companies and governments to start leaning in, not just women themselves. And that will require some structural change that will require putting in place measures to change culture. You know, people always say, you know, cu uh, cultural issues, how, how can we possibly get past that? Well, culture is very much man-made or woman-made, if you want to call it that. Um, and, and that does, there are some very clear strategies that can help change that. It just requires sort of concerted effort. And part of those concerted efforts are, are, are things like the efforts that, that Teresa is making in her specific industry. I just to remind you all, the headline of this press release we put out on Monday, Women in the Firing Line of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. <laughs> Teresa, well, how are you going to address that? I do feel like I'm in the firing line. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think, let me, let me back up and tell just a little bit of a personal story and then I'll get into some of the findings uh, that, that we found in this very specific industry. Um, I've, uh, I, I run the State Investment Board in Washington. We're a very large private equity investor and have been in that asset class since 1981. And in the dozen years that I have been at the uh, State Investment Board, every, you know, anyone who seeks money from the private equity industry comes to us. We're always a first stop because uh, we're a very uh, uh, popular and uh, well-respected investor. And in my entire time there, I can count on one hand the number of women partners that have come through. Typically, the women in these firms are in investor relations. Again, that's an important profession, uh, but they're not the deal makers and they're not the partners. And so I, I had, had observed that. Well, my first Davos was three years ago. And it really came into sharp relief for me, what a big issue it was. Because as a, as a member of the investor industries group and attending the investor industry events, uh, I found myself to be the only woman in the room often other than the forum staff. And thank goodness for the forum staff, because I would have really felt <laughs> out of place. And so in one of the sessions, uh, some of the men, uh, general partners in the private equity industry, were talking about the search for talent and some of the challenges they have in putting together their teams. And it really struck me that they were sitting here talking about a lack or you know, their, their trouble in sourcing good talent, and yet they exclude 50% of the population from their talent pool. And so I publicly, in this one session, made that comment. And it was kind of tongue in cheek, but uh, it got a quite a pretty interesting reaction afterwards. I had so many men come up to me and say, we've tried, we've worked at it. Um, you know, we have trouble sourcing uh, women and we have trouble retaining them. And so my challenge to the industry, if you think about the private equity industry, what, what's its job? It takes really troubled companies and turns them around, or it takes startups and uh, puts them on good footing and gets them going. So the skill set of the private equity industry is solving complex problems. And so I kind of challenged them. I said, listen, just take this approach as if you were taking over a really difficult company and you had to analyze all the, the structural reasons for that and come up with a good business solution. Take that same skill set and apply it to this particular issue. And I think by, in a sense, taking it away from a moral imperative to more of a, it's, it's a business problem to solve. And the guys in the private equity industry are good at that. And so that started a conversation. Um, and then I had a number of conversations with the forum staff. And the forum very generously committed resource to this initiative. And we pulled together uh, a couple sets of meetings. The first was a meeting in New York with a number of the general partners and limited partners. Um, and we just started peeling the onion and started really thinking, OK, what are the challenges? And then in a follow on to that, one of the things that we really did hear from our partners is if this is an important issue to their investors, it will become an important issue for them. So then we pulled together a second event uh, with what we would call the limited partners of the investors in, the, uh, you know, in these funds. And we started talking about, OK, what, is it the, what, what expectations should we have of the industry? So that's kind of how we got to this point. And again, we're finding a lot of both structural and cultural issues uh, that are challenging, but solvable. Mm -hmm. Amara, what, what, what's the recipe? What's your secret yeah. sauce for breaking this, <laughs> this, this barri these barriers down? Yeah, so I have the benefit of being a practitioner myself and working with um, 400,000 clients around the world. And what we hear a lot, is similar to what Teresa is saying, is everyone's stuck in this circular conversation. Is it an economic problem? Is it a business problem? What's the business case? And so we really want to really talk about how are we going to take action and move out of this. So we did commission a study recently, 
And what we did was we wanted to find out whether the millennial generation is going to be the generation to solve this um, problem. And one of the things I found most interesting, and I've gone out and presented this a couple times, is every time I present this, because the millennials believe that, 100% of them believe they will solve the problem, though they think it's going to take them 22 years to do it, which they will no longer be, you know, young, they'll be old like us, um, is that the boomers said, hey, we thought the same thing too. So one of the things um, that, came out of our study, similar to what we saw out of the Mercer study, is that CEOs have to take um, responsibility and they have to get his or their, their leadership teams to, to do it. The second piece that I wanted to point out, and you can um, look at this on our <coughs> website, Seven Steps to Conscious Inclusion, but is there something even more than unconscious bias? And I've, I, and I've heard Sadia talk about unconscious bias. I think it's almost just poor management. Uh, poor management of the talent. So in general, what we've been doing is that we have been living off the generosity of a very robust talent market, and we are basically um, have a strategy that's basically just in time. It's like spot recruiting. I'm going to go out and get somebody. So when you want to go out and just get somebody, there's more men out there than women. And so when they say they can't find them, it's because they don't want to look very hard. They want it in, in one day. And so I think that's a big issue. Um, the third one I really want to point out, which I found to be the most troubling, is when we asked women what was one of the number one things that's going to help you advance into leadership, they um, talked about networking and, and, um, you know, and mentoring. These are nice things that make them feel happy. They make them survive in the organization. They do not make them thrive in the organization. Not one mentioned getting a profit and loss job. And this, these are our millennial women. And I think this is probably one of the most disturbing things that we have to address. Okay. Uh, a suitable juncture to pause for questions. If not, I have many, but please. <laughs> just wait for the microphone, Mum, and um, if you wouldn't mind giving us your name and where you're from. Sure. Uh, I'm Donna Line One. It's what? I'm Donna Line One Leger from uh, USA Today. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Teresa. Um, so you've been here three years now. Last year, the, uh, the gender breakdown was 17% women. This year, it's 18% women, which is a very small uptick, maybe not even statistically significant. Um, where do you see the progress coming from, and how long will it take? You know, one of the reasons that I've tried, well, one of the decisions we made as a group of investors in thinking about how are we going, what are we going to ask of our general partners, we decided not to focus on a number and not to focus on statistics. And I think, um, and instead focus on uh, progress toward a goal and visibility of women. And I think the one thing that I've really observed this year, and it's, it's a huge difference from three years ago, because the forum, even though there's not a lot more women here, the women who are here are being put in very powerful positions um, and been given a voice. If you look at it, every panel has, pretty much every panel has women on it now. That wasn't even three years ago, that wasn't true. And that takes effort. And so I think putting women in visibly powerful positions, that then uh, helps create a feeder pool. Because I think of myself as a, you know, as a young woman coming up in uh, male-dominated careers, I just did not have role models. And I remember reading this one book when I was like 32, 33 years old on CEOs, what it's like to be a CEO. I had aspirations at quite a young age. <laughs> and, and it was such a funny thing because it was just all men, all male uh, models. And I kept thinking, how am I going to possibly do this? And, and I, I think women often run into those situations where I don't look like what you think of as a CEO. I'm a petite, blonde woman, you know. And, and so you have to be able to visualize yourself in a profession to be able to strive for that. So I think uh, having women more visible is a really important and powerful first step. And just to mention as well, the work we do throughout the year, whether it's measuring the gender gap or whether it's uh, spearheading task forces in countries such as Turkey, South Korea, Mexico, to try to put in place the fundamental uh, environment where women can start to thrive, so the leaders of tomorrow are better reflected across both genders. Um, Sadia, there's got to be some good news. I read in the report, very late at night, quite possibly, <laughs> but I read in the report that the, the, the number of women who will progress to senior positions is actually going to increase quite significantly between now and 2020. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the very interesting things that came out. Regardless of how narrow the pool is, how small the pool is that's coming into every industry, um, 
every single, almost every single industry is expecting growth in the middle management and senior management positions. And, and that also shows in terms of the, the strategies they're applying. They're not focusing so much on increasing the pool that's coming in. They're focusing much more on ensuring that women are being retained and promoted. So the good news, the good part of that is we can expect to see change in the next five years. That's at least what the heads of HR of these organizations are predicting. Maybe the, the, the slightly, the aspect of it that still needs to be worked on is for a lot of industries, they actually do have a, a pipeline problem and a perception problem. And they need to be working on changing that as well. So they do need to connect back to universities, back to schools, and help bring women into prof professions they traditionally haven't gone into. And that should be fairly easy to do because in about 100 countries in the world, mm -hmm. women are the majority of those that are enrolled in universities. What it might just now require, given the kind of forecasting tools we have, is a little bit of engineering to yeah. ensure right. that women are actually yeah. going into the areas where mm -hmm. jobs are going to be created. Yeah. Mara, we've known for a while, though, that we need to do something about this problem. Right. It's not new. What, what makes now different? What, what gives you greater optimism? Or do you not have no. any greater optimism? I have to be optimistic. Okay. <laughs> you have to what be optimistic in this business. What are we going to do um, differently? I, I think the difference is we're starting to realize that there is a talent shortage and that driven by demographics and driven by the number of women in university. So I think actually the success of women in university is actually putting a push on businesses. So if they want to really go out and get the best talent, some of the you know women are, are not only graduating at a higher rate, they're graduating with, um, with higher grades and, and higher achievement. And I think that does two things. One, that broadens the talent pool, but also broadens the uh, expectations of those women. If they're successful in the academic environment, they're going to demand to be, um, have the same success in the business environment. And businesses are going to have to respond to that. Teresa? Anything on timing? Anything? Anything? Yeah, easy no, about I mean, now I, makes it good time for us to. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it does start with the, with the talent pool, but but I also think again, uh, getting to Sadi's point, which is it has to be very industry specific. You have to tailor tailor uh, strategies, and in the private equity industry, if you think about a private equity partnership, trust is absolutely vital. And trust is something that builds more quickly with people who are like you. It's just this is the way it is. And so um, one of the things we look at when we're selecting a partner, uh, a new partner, is we look for longevity of the team. We look for um, uh, cohesiveness. We look for an or, you know, a, a group that works really, really well together. And so I think there has been this idea that I need to hire people like me to get that uh, trust in the organization. And I think as we start to sort of peel that away, um, uh, the industry is beginning to say, you know what, yes, that's a really good attribute of, of a partnership, but diversity of opinion is also critical to good investment decision making. So we now have data about how, how both men and women's brains work that we didn't have, say, maybe a decade ago. And we think very differently about risk. Um, and the, the more diversity of opinion you bring to an investment decision, the better investment decision you're going to have. So we have data now that we didn't have before that kind of debunks or maybe offsets mm -hmm. that need for natural trust and affinity. So I think, I think just better data, uh, the conversation is more comfortable for mm -hmm. people than they used to have. You know, when I think when I was growing up, I, I really did not want anyone to even notice I was a woman in my profession. I just wanted to be known for what I, my skill set was. Now I think we're much more comfortable talking about mm -hmm. the very real differences between mm -hmm. the way men and women process information and sort of celebrate those differences and bring them to the forefront in the workplace. Do you think the diversity, I would just be curious, mm -hmm. I think it has it helped that the diversity of the men has changed because globalization yes has now required that men are different. So they're not from the same university, they're not from the, they're not all white males that grew up in, you know, a certain city. They become more diverse because they're from all over the world. Has that helped to create more opportunity for women to kind of penetrate that? I don't know that I, I don't know that that has, yeah. but that's certainly a condition we see. Yeah. I mean, we see incredible cultural and uh, racial and ethnic diversity within the private equity firms yeah. that are global, uh, and we still don't see women. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I think, but, but I mean, it is, it, that's mm -hmm. an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. So we'll come to you in a second, but I just, if I may, just go back to Mara, your comments about university. And um, I believe, again, from reading my Global Gender Gap report avidly, that there's a, a drop off from success in university to success in in professional life and then a further drop off to success at the top echelons of business. So we're losing 
talented women throughout that yes. life cycle, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, this idea. So mm-hmm. what's going wrong? Is that's not enough, is it, just to have successful role models and success at no. university? I, a lot of it, I think, is cultural, and I think we've seen that in the WEF reports um, every year when we do the gender. What's, what's um, preventing women? What are the biggest barriers? It's usually, the first one's usually um, country culture and then company culture. So I think you, you can be successful, but you still have to be accepted and welcomed. And I think a lot of what's happening is companies, you know, used to be the company man, it, you know, trust, look, we all look alike and we're the company man and we dedicate our life. And I think the company man is dead. And I think companies need to replace that. What's the new definition of trust and commitment and loyalty? And if, once we change our minds on that, then we'll be more welcoming to other groups of people. And I think because the pressure we're having uh, for this talent pressure will put more pressure on organizations to break down those barriers. Maybe not fast enough, but I think we'll start to break down. So, uh, Frank Brown, uh, partner at General Atlantic, a uh, large uh, global growth private equity <laughs> firm. Uh, we, were, we were talking this morning, Teresa, and another group about uh, the need for LPs to uh, evaluate GPs and to put some pressure on, and it's not just in private equity, it's across the investment community. Um, The need is really for metrics. You can't just say, okay, what's your percentage partners? You have to look a little deeper. Is there a thought to how we do that and and maybe not necessarily uh, create a standard, but but some idea of metrics that we can all agree upon and, and compare each other and compete a bit? And the one thing that we, we, and we talked a lot about that when the LPs met for this workshop that we held in New York in the fall, and we ultimately didn't come up with a metric, but what we did suggest is that we would ask our partners to develop a strategy and a metric that was meaningful to them, and then track them against their own commitment. And I think, again, it, it, this industry is so, as you know, it's every, every sort of strategy and sector has its own uh, particular focus, and so we felt it would be difficult to come up with something that would work across all the entire industry. Like for instance, a very large leverage buyout firm that has hundreds of employees is going to be able to put a completely different kind of program in place than a very small partnership uh, with you know seven or eight. And so again, what we, what we talked about is let's just ask for a strategy. It's so in the same that we asked for you what your outlook is on the markets and where you're going to, you know, where you're going to commit your money and what you, you know, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to deploy our capital? Um, how are you going to address this issue and then hold you accountable to what you commit to? But this is where collaboration, I think, can help mm-hmm. in that I believe one of the biggest issues is in business, you're rated by financial results, you're not rated on other results. And this is why I think CEO support is so important. I know in our company, one of the things I've been talking to our CEO about is how we rate our top leaders. They need to, it needs to be a scorecard that has multiple factors on it. And some of these are these human factors around what are you doing around your talent pipeline? What, what, how are you developing um, women and, and, and other groups of people? And I think one thing we could do is we could create that because I think a lot of people aren't thinking like that because we've been trained in business school to think in total financial outcomes. And so I think this is one area where we could cross industry, not have, adopt the same one, but adopt the concept and then personalize it for our own companies. Well, I mean, certainly what, you know, what gets measured gets managed. Exactly. I mean, we all know that. Um, and so I'm not suggesting that we don't need metrics, yeah. but I think at this point it's still early stages and yeah. early days, and so we'd love to hear what our partners think is realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also, again, I, I'm really working to make this a collaborative mm-hmm. uh, effort mm-hmm. and not, I mean, I, also as a fiduciary, I have an obligation to maximize return at a prudent level of risk. And where lack of diversity contributes to maybe a a risk profile we don't like, then we can consider it in our investment decision process. But otherwise, we can't can't consider it. So I'm not going to pick a firm based on their gender uh, scorecard. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick a firm based on their investment performance. Mm -hmm. Where this ties into investment performance, then I can think about it. So ultimately, that fiduciary hat is something I have to really wear tight on my head. But I think internally, mm-hmm. companies can be doing this themselves. Absolutely. To measure their, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And Tracy, just a, a point there. It sounds like you're, you've got a plan for your industry, mm-hmm. but are there any other industries you can learn from? Are you trying to do this all, all, all on your own? Is there any best practice mm-hmm. out there? Yeah, I mean, not in financial <laughs> services that I know of. I don't know. Maybe we what should look for one. <laughs> maybe the industry gender gap has some, has some good ideas in yeah, there. Yeah. Maybe there are other ideas that you could look from for different, different vertical sectors. I mean, yeah, and I... I 
I'm it's got to be bespoke. It's got to be got to be Sorry. bespoke for financial maybe services. Maybe maybe you have some ideas because you have a more global perspective. I've been literally very mm -hmm. narrowly focused on this one particular aspect. Yeah. I mean, not surprisingly, perhaps the consumer and retail sector and the media entertainment information yeah. sector is the one, are the two sectors that are doing the best, um, in, both in terms of sort of the the incoming pool, but also in terms of how many are making it into middle and senior management. Mm -hmm. But there are some interesting because of uh, you know th maybe they're not necessarily under that same pressure, but where we're seeing some some change or some desire for collaboration is also in the oil and gas industry, which has actually a very similar mm -hmm. issue in, mm -hmm. in, and very similar profile in terms of um, how few women are involved. And so instead of each company trying to create, you know, its own scholarship for women in s going into science, for example, in, in country X, they're going to try to pool their efforts mm -hmm. so that they're collectively working on getting more women into science, technology, engineering, math. And then whether that talent goes into that industry or elsewhere, it's still setting up, I think, a very different kind of pipeline coming in. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they've got sort of a very specific perception issue, very specific kind of playing field issue within their own organizations. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Just time for one quick question before we, we start finalising this session. Mum, baby to you. Have you got the microphone there? George. Okay. You can be loud. <laughs> you can be loud and with a microphone. Yeah. Shout. Donna, again from USA Today. Is there a particular um, point at which women in the financial service industry sort of disconnect from that upward movement, that movement into yeah. leadership? Where is that? Culture, co corporate cultural divide. Women still have the babies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a physical mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so a lot of women, when they uh, begin to contemplate uh, starting a family, um, you know, the traditional response is to bend to mommy track them. We're going to make it easier on you. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. And we had, in, in one of the workshops we had, we had a, a founder of a, a private equity firm who's been quite progressive uh, on these issues. And what he said, what, what he had done with some of his star women is instead of mommy tracking it, making it easy for him, he'd think of the toughest, coolest, most interesting deal and lure him back into the workplace with that deal. And if anyone doesn't think women are just as competitive as oh, men, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we are. And, um, we, I, I, and, and, the, and the other men in the room, when they heard that, they just loved that concept. But, but one of the things that was so interesting, they said, well, we don't even know how to have those conversations with a woman in terms of what should we be doing, you know, because they're afraid to, yeah. you know, for all the legal reasons, and they're afraid to. And so the, this particular uh, GP founder's response was, the men are the ones who actually need mentoring. <laughs> they need to learn how they can have these kinds of conversations appropriately. Um, the women need the sponsors. The women need the ones that actually gives them the tough job and the opportunity, but the men need mentoring and how to, how to do this. So I think, again, a lot of it, the conversations have changed and it's easier, but that is probably one of the biggest places uh, where you start seeing women peel off. Uh, a couple of the major uh, firms have done some really interesting things in the last couple of years. Um, one uh, major LBO firm has uh, put in a policy now <laughs> where uh, their women deal makers uh, can, well, and their men too, can take a caretaker, a child caretaker mm -hmm. with them when they travel and they'll pay for it. Um, so that really helps during that transition when, you know, you got young babies. Um, another has extended maternity leave. Uh, uh, quite substantially. So there's a lot. The, the other thing, too, is getting away from what I call a FaceTime culture. You know, with technology exactly. now, it does not matter exactly. where you work. And mm -hmm. private equity historically has been a FaceTime culture. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you hang together from early morning till late at night. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to uh, always be there to be productive. You can be uh, at home, you know, baby in one hand, cell phone in the other, and still get business done. So technology has, has enabled uh, that as well. Now, we're running very, very close to time, if we're not over already. But before we finish, I'd just like each of you to give us your one priority for the year ahead. What one thing would you like to see achieved? I'm going to start with you, Sadia. OK. Well, we got our mandate this morning from the trustees for the Global Challenge on Gender Parity, which is really where the forum does the bulk of its work on gender equality throughout the year. And I think you know, one, one area will certainly be to continue to provide the measurement tools that we've been providing. But a second is to actually provide more of a space for action and collaboration. And that'll happen both at a national level and also taking the, the, the work that's been done in experiments such as yours and seeing can we help create a similar mindset or a similar set of work in other industries. Mara. 
Uh, change happens from individuals, and I think we need to have a little less conversation and a little more action. I think every individual that's been at the forum can do one thing that will make difference to one woman, and then we will have more change. Teresa. Uh, I would like to see uh, our private equity partners commit to a plan, develop and commit to a plan. And one of the things that Melissa Ma and I are going to be doing after this is going around and speaking with a number of the partners and asking them what, what, could they, what, what kind of plan could they commit to. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us for this uh, lively, energetic discussion. This session is now over. Thanks, Thank you.